All right. Today we're finishing up a series of messages on the essentials of the Christian faith. But next week, Katie and I are going to be out of town. We're going to go uh, take a couple of days and just get away. It'll be the first time we've been out of Salida since Caffrey was born. And so we're going to be uh, worshiping with her grandmother next week in Denver. So uh, we won't be here. Uh, Jerry is going to bring the message next week. And then in May, we'll, uh, we'll start something new. But today is the last message in this Essentials series, and the whole idea of this series is we've been looking at the key things that Christians believe in six areas. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about people, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the church, and then today about last things? And just as a reminder, if you missed any of these, these are all recorded. They're all up on the church website. If you're like, oh, I need to go back and listen to that one again uh, and again and again. Maybe it should be a paid thing. I don't know. (laughs) So today we're talking about the last one, the doctrine of last things. The technical name for this is eschatology. Eschatology covers things like uh, the return of Christ, final judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, uh, annihilation, and things like that. And so it's a little controversial. People don't all have like the same view on everything uh, under this. But so the whole topic of eschatology is trying to answer the question, where is it all headed? Where is this all, this whole human thing, where is it all going? What do we have to look forward to? What's on the horizon for us? And so some will say this is the study of hope. Because it's what, what do we have to look forward to? But eschatology, as we're going to see this morning, this is not just about musing over the future and, oh boy, I just wonder what's going to happen and maybe it'll be this. This is deeply, deeply rooted in what Jesus has accomplished and in what the church is supposed to be about and, uh, and how human society and life is supposed to be organized. And so I think that out of all six, this is probably the most practical of all six. So uh, we'll, well, let's pray, and then we will, we'll dive into eschatology. Our God, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for the spirit that you give us to fill us with life and newness. And we pray that you will... Use this time this morning to convict us and to bring us closer to you, to fill us with hope. Lord, we love you. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen? All right, so we're talking about eschatology, the doctrine of what is to come. But to understand and appreciate what Christians believe about what is to come, we have to have a really thick Uh, level-headed and brutally honest assessment of the world as it is. And one thing that the scriptures are always trying to do is to get us to come to certain conclusions about the way that the world is. And to come to conclusions that we may not be comfortable with, that we may not want to admit, uh, or at least that we don't want to admit it to the depth and the density that scripture is calling us to believe it. So, 1884, there was a magazine released by the Disciples of Christ. It's another branch of the Restoration Movement that, that our church is a part of. And the, so, the Christian Oracle, 1884, it lasted for about 16 years before the editor suggested that they rename it to the Christian Century. And the Christian Century is still out today. It's a bi-weekly magazine. And the reason that he suggested they change the name is because there was this widespread optimism at the turn of the 20th century that the 20th century was going to be our year. Things are going to go really well in the 20th century, and God's people are going to take the world by storm, and the church is really going to live in harmony with advances in technology and communication and culture and science and all kinds of stuff. But is that what happened? those of you who know American history. The 20th century was one of the bloodiest and most destructive centuries in recorded history. Scripture is warning us against having an optimistic view of history. Things are not getting better. 
We are not edging ever closer to this universal peace and prosperity. It's actually the opposite. We are in a real mess. And all of the technology, all of the uh, awareness, all the diplomacy, all the education in the world will never fix the fact that the world is flatlining. We are stuck and there's nothing we can do about it. Scripture invites us to see the world as a place that's saturated with pride, the desire to be more than someone else, whether that's Eve who desires the fruit and wants, uh, she sees that it'll make her wise, and so she wants it because it'll make her more, or if it's uh, the Babylonians building their tower so they can make a name for themselves, or Pharaoh who uh, refuses to let the Hebrew slaves go, or just someone refusing to admit that they failed. Pride pits human beings against one another. It's by nature competitive, and it's all about who's going to be on top. It it believes that honor and dignity are scarce resources, and so you got to get while the getting's good. Scripture also wants us to recognize injustice, that injustice is is really, it's just crookedness, but it's wherever vulnerable people are being taken advantage of, or wherever minorities or the marginalized are um, scorned or denied resources, that's injustice. When humans do what's best for themselves rather than what's best for the whole or for the other, it's injustice. And injustice and violence often go hand in hand, And so as far back as Cain and Abel, humans have used violence to assert themselves over the other, uh, to get what they want at the expense of someone else. Humans use violence as a tool to get what I want. We will threaten one another with pain and with death. And when there's no one to referee human behavior, there's just anarchy, in, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was good in his own eyes. Everybody gets to define what is good for themselves when there is no uh, referee for human behavior. But the scriptures also call us to hold the conviction that the world as it is, is not how God wants it to be, but that the world is actually deviant from what God wants Things are not going according to plan. Uh, Things are derailing and they are off balance. And so the story of the Bible is the story of what God has done to intervene and what God continues to do to intervene to restore order and life and blessing uh, to the world. Listen to what he says when he calls Israel to be his chosen people. This is in Exodus 19. He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So the idea when God forms Israel together is that every man, every woman, every child will be a priest so that the nation itself becomes a nation of priests and they're going to mediate God's blessing to the rest of the world. They exist to be a light for everybody else and through them he's going to bring blessing and order and peace to the world. And then what follows this is like five chapters of God giving instructions about how to do that and what the just and orderly and peaceful and blessed society looks like. And he calls them to to live out this ideal in Exodus 20 through 24. But perennially, Israel fails to live up to that blueprint over and over and over. they, They mess up. They prove to be just as self-centered and just as violent and oppressive and proud as all the other nations. 
They, when they come in to conquer the land, they're just as brutal as the people that they're conquering. They ask God to give them a king so they can be like everybody else. The great King Solomon, who's known for his wisdom, he drafts slave labor out of his own people. He, he's uh, getting gold from his own people so that he can build this extravagant palace for himself, uh, just the same way that Pharaoh did years, centuries earlier. Israel wages civil war with one another. They murder one another. They, uh, they take advantage of orphans and widows. Like, it's just not good. Israel fails utterly to live up to the blueprint that God is calling them to live out in Exodus 19. And so the prophets eventually arise in Israel. And the prophets remember the blueprint. They remember what God has called them to do. And then they speak to Israel and say, remember, do this. Remember what happens if you don't do this and live out this way. And so the the prophets are constantly pushing them back to their founding covenant. So in uh, Jeremiah 22, Jeremiah is one of the prophets. He says in verse 3, Thus says the Lord, Do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. So you can imagine the kinds of things that they've been doing, and he's calling them to walk away from all of it. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, the prophet says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Micah 6, verse 8, he has told you, O man, what is good and And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Amos 5, verse 24, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So the prophets are always calling the people back to be this just society, to be this whole society and to model for the rest of the world God's blessing and peace and order. But Israel continues to fail in spite of the prophets, and it becomes increasingly clear that they will never do this on their own. They will never humble themselves. What they need is for God to intervene and to to create this order and blessing from the ground up. And to somehow put a stop to all of the crazy. Because human beings on our own, we we cannot build the just society from the ground up. It has to happen from the top down. And so the prophets start talking about the day that God is going to do this. They call this the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming when the former age or the present age that has this uh, pride and and violence and, and injustice and death and decay and all of this stuff, it will finally come to an end. God will intervene decisively in history and there will be a pivot and there will be a future age of blessing and righteousness and all of these nice buzzwords. So, for example, uh, Isaiah chapter 2, he says, it shall come to pass in the latter days, and then he lists all these things that are going to happen, the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So they're going to take their instruments of war and turn them into instruments of cultivation and and agriculture. And then in uh, Zephaniah, or no, one more in Isaiah. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that's lifted up, and it shall be brought low. And then in Zephaniah chapter 2. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So this day is coming when the, the present age comes to an end and then the future age of blessing and order and righteousness come to pass. 
Uh, I want to show you a picture of the Dead Sea. This is taken from Masada, which is kind of on the south end of the Dead Sea. And so you can kind of see the terrain. I don't know if you can make out the water there at the top of the picture. What I really want you to see is the kind of terrain around it. It's desolate. And it's very, very hot all the time. At the end of the book of Ezekiel, the prophet has this vision of water flowing out of God's throne in Jerusalem. And at first, it's just a trickle. And then it's kind of a puddle. And then it's like ankle deep. And then it's like knee deep. And then it's a raging river. And the river is flowing through this area. And everything here becomes lush and green. And that's his way of describing this day that comes, that God brings to, to an end the world being like that, and he makes it into a place of lushness and greenness and life and vitality. The book of Daniel talks about the same thing. In chapter 2, we read the story of Nebuchadnezzar who has a dream about a statue, and the statue is made of all these different kinds of metal, gold and silver and bronze and iron and clay, and then a giant rock that's unhewn by human hands. It's just a rock. Smashes into the statue and knocks it over and destroys it. And then we learn that the statue represents the, the empires of the world, that the different metals are a series of empires, and this rock is the kingdom of God. And it's not made by human hands. And it comes and destroys all the kingdoms of the world, and it becomes the eternal kingdom. This uh, universal reign of peace and justice and blessing is symbolized as this rock. Daniel imagines the coming of God's peace and, and this age of blessing as a kingdom. That one day a kingdom is going to come. And it will be very different from all the other kingdoms, but it will supplant them. This is the hope of the prophets that things are really messed up right now and humans are never going to be able to fix it, but one day God is going to intervene and in a moment everything is going to transition and the old age of death and decay is all going to pass away and there will be a future age where everything is lush and green and full of life. Are you tracking with me? Is this all kind of making sense so far? And then one day along comes Jesus. And Jesus does a lot of stuff, and he says a lot of stuff. But the writers of the Gospels up front toward the beginnings of their Gospels will give us little summaries of what Jesus is all about. All of his miracles, all of his teachings, everything gets plugged into this one idea. This is how Matthew puts it, Matthew 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or in Mark chapter 1, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus claims that he comes to bring this new kingdom. He's essentially claiming that he is the rock from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He's come to dig out Ezekiel's river, he has come to perform the day of the Lord. And so you best get on the right side of history and repent because you don't want to be on the wrong side when the day comes. Now, what would you expect someone like that to do? What would you think if, if someone said, I'm the rock that's going to crush all the kingdoms of the world, what kinds of things would you expect? That he's going to storm Caesar's palace with swords and clubs and he's going to topple the empire. Or maybe he's going to try to make a name for himself. He's going to try to get famous. He's going to accumulate wealth and resources. But if he did that, how would he be any different from Caesar or Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or any of the, those who have come before him? He wouldn't be any different. If his kingdom is going to be the rock and not just the next metal in that statue, the next in a series of empires, then he's going to have to take a different tack. 
you would want to see him be humble instead of proud like all the others. You would expect him to give attention and compassion to uh, the vulnerable and for him to criticize the powerful. You would expect for him to restore order and to foster life and to love his enemies. In fact, uh, he calls his citizens to do the same thing. Listen to Luke 6. Jesus says this. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But you love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you'll be sons and daughters of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Jesus himself embodies this alternative way of being in the world. He becomes what Israel was supposed to be. Uh, He lives this life of humility instead of pride and of order and justice instead of oppression and injustice. And he's He's not only creating little pockets of this new society, but then he calls those who follow him to do the same thing. And this does not make him very, po- very popular with powerful people. In fact, it makes him so unpopular that they decide to kill him. And in the height of their pride, they commit a violent act of injustice so that they can maintain their dominance. And they have him crucified. They use death as a tool to get what they want. And we are here today because we have a conviction that the story does not end there, but instead God raised Jesus from the dead. Amen? He overcame human stupidity and arrogance with his love and with his life. He defeated human violence by allowing them to use as much of it as they could possibly muster on him and then to rise again. And in that way, Jesus becomes king. He doesn't become king the way that other kings become king. The resurrection of Jesus is that day of the Lord that brings in this new age. The resurrection of Jesus is why we're here. It's the centerpiece of our faith. Now, this morning, we're here specifically to talk about eschatology, the things that are to come. And here is the essential thing that Christians believe about eschatology. For whatever else we may say, this, that the coming age has already begun. The age that the prophets anticipated when God would overthrow all the empires and and he would conquer our hatred with his love and he'd establish this age of blessing and peace and order. That's already happened. It's already here. It started on the first Easter when Jesus walked out of the tomb. Now, is there still pride and anarchy and all this stuff in the world? Do we still see all that kind of stuff? Absolutely, you betcha. And so it's not that this future age of peace and blessing and and all that has uh, completely supplanted the old age, but what we believe instead is that the resurrection of Jesus marks a decisive turning point in history. If we go back to Daniel, I've got Daniel on the brain. I don't know if you guys know this because I'm teaching it right now, but in Daniel 7, uh, he has a dream very similar to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. But instead of a series of metals that represent different empires, he sees a series of monsters that represent different empires. And then he sees God, or one who's advanced in years, the Ancient of Days. And God takes their authority from these monsters and hands it to one like a son of man who comes on the clouds of heaven. And right in the middle of this chapter, Daniel says this, verse 11. And as I looked, the beast, that is the last of the series of beasts, was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rests of the beasts, 
Their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So in Daniel's dream, the empires of the world that are signified by these monsters have their dominion taken away, but they still exist. They're still around, they just don't have any power. And what the resurrection means is that that has already happened. The authority of the empires of the world have been taken away and given to Jesus, who says, all authority in heaven and all authority on earth belongs to me. And yet the empires still exist. So Christians live in this weird kind of in-between time, this liminal space where we know that the coming age has already arrived, and yet the the old age is still going on. There's like an overlap. There's a competition between the two orders. On one hand, the day of the Lord has come, and the old has passed away, and all authority belongs to him, and the kingdom is here. And on the other hand, the old age is still alive and kicking. On one hand, we live in the future, and on the other hand, we conduct ourselves in a world filled with people who still live by the old way as though the old order were still in charge. And so every human being has to make a choice about how we're going to live. Either we continue to put our money on sin and death winning the day, and we look out for our own interests and our self, and we continue in our pride. Or we can acknowledge that there is a new king, and there is a new kingdom and a new way of being in the world a way that is not intimidated by death, one that establishes justice and peace. And at every point, the scriptures call us to acknowledge that he is indeed alive and that the old way is passe. And should you believe that, and should you decide to transfer your allegiance from the old way to the new king, that you mark that in baptism that you'd publicly declare your allegiance by being baptized. And so if you haven't been baptized, the Bible teaches that you have no part in Christ, that you are outside of his kingdom because you have not publicly said, he is my Lord in the way that he tells you to do it. But if you have been baptized, then you're, you're inducted into this new kingdom. You're now a citizen of this alternative society that is uh, trickling out into the old society. You, uh, you are a citizen of this alternative and ultimately victorious kingdom. And so it makes no sense for you to live in the old ways. Listen to what Paul says. This is Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Ephesians chapter 4. You were taught to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and which is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians chapter 3. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. 1 Peter chapter 1. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Same book, chapter 2. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Over and over and over and over, we are called to live out the confession of our baptism and to live as citizens of this coming age, even now in the former age. To be a holy nation is to live in the world 
as an alternative to the ways of pride and injustice and violence and death and decay and all of that. I'm a citizen of another kingdom, another age, and I embody that new kingdom in the way that I relate with other believers in the church community, in the way that we treat one another with dignity and that we try to outdo one another in showing honor and how we treat one another as more important than ourselves and in the way that we love one another. I embody the new age in the way that I participate in the market, in the way that I think about or use or abstain from using violence, in the way that I prioritize my loyalties, in the way that I conduct myself, in the ways of righteousness and wisdom, in the way that I work for peace in my home and in my workplace and in my community and in my society, in the way I control my anger. Everything I live out that I'm a member of a new kingdom that's already here. Why do Christians live the way that we do? It's not because we think that by doing so, we're going to make the world a better place. Because this year, this century is not our century. We're not going to be able to build this thing from the ground up. It has to be top down. We live the way that we do because we are witnesses to the arrival of a new kingdom and a new order. Are you with me? Okay, now let's be fair. Is that how Christians live all the time? It's kind of an idealized vision. Like that's not, have you actually talked with other Christians? It's not how we are all the time. We still uh, get angry. We still mess up. And here's why I think that is. The problem is that our spirits have been renewed and are to be continually renewed. Paul just told us to not be conformed, but to be transformed in the renewing of our minds. But our bodies have not been renewed. That the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our, our flesh is still captive to the power and the talons of sin and decay and death that are plunged into us. And the resolution in the Bible is never that we're supposed to ditch our body altogether and one day our spirit is finally going to be free of that nasty old thing and we're just going to float off and, and that's our, our hope. The hope in Scripture is always that one day even my body will be redeemed. That sin and decay and death will no longer have any sway over the cells and the muscles and the organs of my body. And so we look forward to a day when our bodies will be redeemed. When the resurrection of Jesus gets reenacted in my own body, I'm, I'm just waiting for my body to sort of catch up with my spirit because I need to be res resurrected the same way that Jesus was resurrected. And so I participate in what he has already accomplished. And the biblical promise over and over and over is that when he returns, that is exactly what will happen. That the citizens of his kingdom will be resurrected and new bodies that are not vulnerable to the power of sin or death or decay or pride is the kind of body we will have. We'll be totally free, totally redeemed. And on that day, the old age will finally topple to the ground. The statue will finally hit the ground and the last monster will finally perish. And the present age comes to an end, and all that will be left is the future age. Listen to Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Ephesians 1. I pray that you may know the power that he worked in Christ when he, God, raised him from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and every power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And then one more, 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So a day is coming when the truth will be exposed. And the old age will be gone completely and forever. Jesus will surrender the world that belongs to him to God the Father. And that day will come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye like a thief in the night. But until that day comes, we wait. We live in hope. We live out our faith. We live out our allegiance to the new king. We embody the new kingdom as best we know how. We live lives devoted to holiness, to being this alternative people with a different set of concerns and practices and habits and routines and loves and desires. We live as though the kingdom of heaven were already set up on the earth because it is. Let me pray for us. Our God, you are good, and we acknowledge uh, that uh, your dominion is an everlasting dominion, that you you are king, uh, and uh, all authority belongs to you. And uh, Lord, we thank you for what you've already accomplished in Christ's death and resurrection and what you have empowered us to be. And we long for the day that you finish what you've started in us, that you bring Uh, your work to completion. We long for the redemption of our bodies and for the redemption of your world, for the redemption of, uh, of human society and for all of creation. We look forward to this uh, with, with eager hope. And we say, come Lord Jesus. And we pray all of this by the authority of his name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys.